going to go ahead and get us started uh, just to get some introductions. My name is Maria Margaret Leone. I'm the programs director here at DBSA, and I am pleased to introduce this important session on bipolar disorder across the lifespan. I am joined by my colleague, Hannah Zeller, and two of our esteemed scientific advisory board members, Dr. Tina Goldstein and Dr. Andrew Nirenberg. Uh, Dr. Goldstein is a licensed psychologist and the Pittsburgh Foundation Endowed Professor in Psychiatry Research at the University of Pittsburgh, where she serves as co-director of the Child and Adolescent Bipolar Spectrum Services Clinic. Her work aims to develop improved prevention and intervention strategies for youth informed by enhanced understanding of the relationship between biological and psychosocial determinants of mood disorder and suicide. Dr. Nirenberg uh, is the director of the Doughton Family Center for Bipolar Treatment Innovation at Massachusetts General Hospital. He is also associate director of the Depression Clinical and Research Program, co-director of the Center for Clinical Research Education, and holds the Thomas B. Hackett MD Endowed Chair in Psychiatry at Mass General Hospital. And he is a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, uh, Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts. Thank you both for joining us today. Um, Thanks so much for having us. We're so glad that you're with us today. Um, uh, we want participants to know that as we uh, go through this session, if you have questions that come up, please put them in the chat. We will be monitoring the chat throughout session, uh, the Q&A function. Um, and we will be making time at the end of the session to answer any questions that you may have. But as you think of questions throughout the session, please pop them in the Q&A section and we'll try to integrate them as we go. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Maria to start with our first question. All right, great. Uh, thanks, Hannah. So um, just to, to get us on board here, we're looking at understanding uh, challenges of um, diagnosing a child with bipolar understanding how symptoms may be different or change throughout their lifespan, and understand some current uh, treatment options for bipolar disorder. So uh, to start us off, Dr. Nirenberg, do you wanna talk about what factors and symptoms make up bipolar disorder? How, does, how do you uh, get diagnosed with bipolar disorder? So I'm gonna take the easy side of it and first talk about adults. And, and then uh, Tina and I can talk about how it differs in kids and how it can vary. And with adults, it may be more variable than people might think. Now, in order to get the diagnosis of bipolar disorder, one assumes that you have to have an unequivocal manic or hypomanic episode. And that's a distinctly different period during which people are essentially a, in a high energy state they can be grandiose, they can be elated, they can be irritable. Uh, they don't have to be all three. They could be one of those three th things. In addition to needing less sleep and feeling quite energized, talking faster, thinking faster, having a decrease in their usual good judgment so that they might be more impulsive and would do things that they wouldn't ordinarily do. You know, spend your life savings on a car, you know, for example, not a good idea, that sort of thing. And they can also get into trouble both in relationships and with work. Now, one of the other things that can be associated with is hallucinations or delusions while they are manic. So that that's how it, it can manifest itself. And hypomania, it's less severe, it not so interfering. Um, but it's not less severe overall because people can still have quite bad depressions. So let me stop there and turn it over to Tina. How does it differ? How is it different, kids? That is like the million dollar question. <laughs> um, I, I mean, for so many years in the field, uh, you know, even when I was starting, there were many people who didn't even think you could have bipolar disorder before you were 18. Um, but then, you know, the field itself started reflecting back and thinking about our own clinical experiences and recognizing that most adults, when they think back to when their symptoms started, actually report over 50% report that they actually started in childhood. And so that made us all kind of like pause for thought and think, 
wait a minute, like, you know, how do we understand and be more keen to identifying bipolar disorder in childhood and adolescence? And so I think it's really only been in the last 20 or 30 years that the field has come to do lots of research to better understand like what is childhood and adolescent onset bipolar disorder? How does it look different than it looks in adults? And how do we do a better job of recognizing it early um, and intervening early so that we can potentially change some trajectories? And so, um, you know, when we're thinking about uh, bipolar disorder in kids, overall, we're really looking at the same diagnostic criteria. And so at the end of the day, we all use the DSM by and large to diagnose bipolar disorder. And we're looking for those symptoms that occur episodically, symptoms that cluster, cluster together in episodes of mania or hypomania, like Dr. Nirenberg just described, or symptoms that cluster together in episodes of depression. And so that is very similar to what we see in youth with bipolar disorder. There was early on a debate about whether there's a more chronic course in youth with bipolar disorder. And I think the research at this point is pretty clear that the answer is yes and no. And so what I mean by that is that in order to diagnose bipolar disorder in children and adolescents, we still expect to see clear episodes that are a change from that child's normal functioning, their normal mood, their normal energy. And we really want those symptoms to cluster in time and not just be a symptom here, a symptom here, a symptom here. It's very much the same in adults. But what we've learned is that in children and adolescents, there does on average, even among kids who meet the full criteria for bipolar disorder using our DSM, which is kind of like the psychiatry Bible of diagnosis, that children and adolescents tend to have more mood switches in an average year. And they can also have more times where their symptoms of mania and depression can co-occur. And so we'll talk about mixed episodes some more in a couple of minutes, I know. Um, but basically what we're looking for is clear changes that are episodic, very similar to what happens in adulthood. But some of where the challenge comes in is that by and large, the DSM was written for adults. And you all have probably heard this adage before, but we really live by it in child psychiatry, which is that children and adolescents are not just little adults. And that in fact, you know, our brains continue to develop up through our 20s. Um, and there are so many other factors that are happening throughout child and adolescent development, um, like the onset of puberty and hormones and our brain development not to mention just the way symptoms present differently. So for example, when Dr. Nirenberg was talking about, you know, what impulsivity may look like an adult in an adult during mania, you know, we oftentimes see people go on spending sprees, um, you know, buy things that they don't need, overspend, but most of our child and adolescent patients don't have the capacity to do that. Some of them find the capacity, but by and large, impulsivity, even hypersexuality can present very, very differently in children and adolescents because of normative child development. What we know about their capacity, um, the opportunities that are available to them. And so, for example, in a child or adolescent, hypersexuality may look like drawing inappropriate pictures at school um, or inappropriate touching of a teacher or a parent, whereas in an adult, it may look like infidelity in a marriage. And so, these are a lot of the things that we keep in mind as we're trying to diagnose or sometimes undiagnosed bipolar disorder in kids. And so I think that's my other important point on um, the issue of the diagnosis in children is that we've seen both that there have been overdiagnosis in the community um, and also underdiagnosis. And for good reason, it's a really, really tricky disorder to appropriately identify 
not just in children and adolescents, but occasionally and not infrequently in adults as well. I, I think one of the other things that we, we should make sure we mention is that with that great description that you just gave, um, that both the kids and the adults have a lot of other problems mm -hmm. and that it is turns out to be the fairly unusual case that someone has bipolar disorder and nothing else. And, and we see that all the time in the adults. Uh, what do you see in the kids? Yeah, we use, we have lots of little bylines in our clinic and um, that we use with families and in our own, you know, daily practice and comorbidity, you know, the co-occurrence between bipolar disorder and so many other psychiatric disorders, it's, it's the rule rather than the exception. And the data suggests even more so in kids than in adults, although it's ever present in adults as well. And so, I mean, the most common comorbidity by far in young people is ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And so on the one hand, there's lots of overlap between the symptoms of ADHD and particularly mania and hypomania, although some depression, problems with concentration, problems with impulsivity. Um, so there's a lot of overlap. And even when we very carefully apply the DSM criteria and use and used semi-structured interviewing approaches that last far longer and are far more in depth than most people get in the community, it's really clear that somewhere between 50 and 80% of youth who clearly have bipolar disorder also clearly have ADHD. And then there are tons of other common comorbidities. So things like anxiety disorders, oppositional defiant disorder, other behavioral disorders in childhood are incredibly commonly co-occurring. Um, certainly we see a lot of separation anxiety disorder in youth. Um, who come to our clinic, lots of trauma and co-occurring post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and then I know as our young people age into young adulthood and adulthood, there are some similarities and then some kind of emerging disorders. And so maybe you wanna talk a little bit more about that, Dr. Nirenberg, some of the comorbidities that we're much more likely to see in adulthood. So I think one of the things that that happen in particularly in adulthood, which turns out to be pretty bad, is a nicotine addiction, mm -hmm. and and um, in, in addition to nicotine addiction of, the, of addiction, of course, there's substance use disorders that happen, but it, you know the the rates of smoking are extraordinarily high in this population, and it may surprise you that there's an independent association between smoking and suicide mm -hmm. and uh people have speculated why that might be true but but you know it's particularly bad what is less bad in the adults but it's worse in the kids is marijuana mm -hmm. and and also especially these days is, is really widespread and alcohol turns out to be worse uh, for a lot of people um so that's one of the things that really can happen that causes tremendous increased suffering Something else I've been reading about is um, eating disorders. Um, so binge eating disorder. Uh, so that's maybe how that looks in, in younger and uh, adolescents. And then turns out, you know, bipolar disorder is, is uh, uh, diagnosed down the road. Yeah, and I, and I think this is the great challenge that, that Dr. Goldstein and, and her colleagues face is that you can have a bunch of different problems that don't crystallize into a clear picture until later. So for example, like with adults, you can have people who have episode of depression, 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 then they have their first episode of mania, and you don't know what they have when they're only depressed and they haven't yet had their mania or hypomania. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on Wednesday, we're doing a special session on um, misdiagnosis, which uh, is, it can be, um, uh, I don't wanna say a misnomer, but it may not be true because um, diagnosis change over time and different things present at different times. I know a lot of times we'll see um, 
people who experience mania may not understand that it's mania. And so why, you know, I just, I was very productive. Why, why am I going to talk to you about that? I feel really good about it. So can you talk a little bit about um, uh, when you're diagnosing or how that, as that changes through the age, how you might um, deal with that and how you might approach that? Dr. Yeah. Goldstein, you want to take that on? <laughs> sure, I'll start and then we can, you know, kind of do some back and forth. I think, you know, diagnosis, particularly throughout child development, although I imagine it continues into adulthood as well, we really approach it more as a longitudinal process, um, you know, that these kids are continuing to age and grow and develop. And so sometimes what we're seeing in this moment is a snapshot of what will ultimately develop over time. Um, and so I think it's always critical for us and our patients and families to keep that in mind, um, that we're all doing the best we can to do really reliable diagnosis and assessment. But for a variety of reasons, sometimes patients and families come presenting today and saying, here's our biggest problem today. And then two weeks from today, two years from today, 22 years from today, it may be something different. And, you know, we do our best to do a really thorough history um, and thinking back on, you know, and what has happened that has gotten you here and what else has happened in the past. Um, but like Dr. Nirenberg indicated, sometimes, and particularly with our youth, they may have first presented with depression and have not yet had an episode of mania or hypomania. And so if I'm meeting that child today, I would diagnose them with major depressive disorder. And then if six months from now they present and they're manic or hypomanic, we would then be thinking about changing their diagnosis to bipolar disorder with a really thorough assessment. Um, it's also true that it's not uncommon, at least in our clinic, that we will do a really thorough assessment. And at the end of the day, our answer about diagnosis is we're not sure. And, you know, for a long time, especially when I was just starting out in this field, I was pretty uncomfortable with that because I thought it meant that I wasn't doing a good job, that we were supposed to have all of the answers. And in fact, particularly with young people, but I think with adults as well, you know, we're asking a lot of really specific questions that require um, patients and families to reflect back on things like sleeping patterns, eating patterns, clusters of symptoms, what happened when. It's kind of a unique frame to be asking people to recall. I know if you asked me what I ate for breakfast last week, it would be hard for me to tell you, much less was I sleeping eight hours on Wednesday and 10 hours on Thursday when my mood changed. And so, um, you know, some families have are very clear about that. Um, and for other people, you know, sometimes the course of this illness is not so clear. Um, and there are very different presentations. And so, um, you know, at the end of a long assessment, after asking lots of questions and putting my head together with my colleagues and patients and families, what we'll do is send folks home with some mood diaries and sleep diaries to chart over time. What are they noticing? Um, and then come back in two weeks, come back in four weeks. Let's talk again with more information um, because accurate diagnosis is really important um, for us in, to determine what is the best what are the best treatment options moving forward? And so um, as I've been doing this longer, I fully appreciate that I'd much rather be cautious um, and thoughtful together with the family to try and figure out what is going on here um, because it's, it's complicated. There's a good reason it took us this long in the field um, you know, to really embrace the idea that pediatric bipolar disorder exists because it's messy. The diagnosis can be really, really tough. I, I think that's extremely important. And these days, I really approach people with a hypothesis mm -hmm. and saying, you know, your current presentation is consistent with the hypothesis that this might be your diagnosis, which may or may not change with additional information. And to be able to get information from other informants and from looking prospectively can really help over time. Um, 
the, the other thing I just want to mention before I forget is you talked about anxiety in kids. And it turns out the same thing exists in adults and frequently overlooked. Mm -hmm. And it's surprising how few studies there are of treating the coexisting anxiety for people who have bipolar disorder. No question. No question. I'm also, I want to go back to something you mentioned, Dr. Nirenberg, that I think was really critical, not just in young people, but in adults as well. Um, but I think can be particularly helpful with young people who may not always have the language or the insight to report on their own symptoms. You know, we interview kids as little as five or six in the clinic. Um, and, you know, sometimes they don't have the language, the vocabulary to be able to express what they're feeling. We try to use lots of, lots of um, you know, developmentally appropriate tools. If you look around my office, you can see lots of games and pictures and pictures of faces and emotions. Um, but it's, it's normative that they may not have the words to describe some of what's going on inside. And we also talk to their parents who are observing what's going on outside that may or may not, um, you know, really map onto their internal state. You know, sometimes what comes out on the outside is, you know, anger, um, when really what's happening on the inside is anxiety or frustration, but that the kids don't have the language for that. And so making sure that we have multiple sources of information, so not just, you know, the child you know, doing some faces over time to identify their emotions and their sleep, but having the parent rate those things. We get teacher reports, babysitter reports, everybody who's in this child's life who may see them in different settings. All of those things together can be immensely helpful in informing our diagnosis and treatment priorities, regardless of diagnosis. Like, what is most getting in the way um, for this kid in terms of their functioning at school, at home, at camp, wherever it may be? And so, I'm really glad you mentioned that because I think that's such a critical part um, in terms of diagnosis and even determining whether our treatments are working. Um, because there's what we see from the outside and then there's the kid's internal experience. You, you said uh -huh. something in, in passing that I think is also extraordinarily important because I, I, I think in the, in the adult world, uh, we don't ask this enough and that's what matters to you. Mm -hmm. What matters to you the most that, that really needs to be addressed and that if it was better would make a huge difference in your life. Yeah, and I and I would be remiss if I did not mention that we have some of these tools on our website, both for children and for adults. And um, I mean, this is just such an important the communication between doctor and the the whole health perspective of what affects um, a person. So, you know, different. Um, uh, the onset of of uh, adolescent and or uh, young adulthood, you know children are leaving school, going to a different, living in a different place, and suddenly their support drops. And so then some of these other symptoms emerge. Um, can, before we get too far off track, can, uh, can you two talk about different types of um, bipolar disorder? And then we can get into the, what rapid cycling is, what mixed features are, all those other brainy things. Sure, and I'll actually, can ahead. I add a call to that from the chat? Because someone in the chat has asked, and I think it's so great we're having such a nuanced conversation about diagnosis. Someone in the chat asked, can a person be diagnosed as bipolar two and then be by, by diagnosed as bipolar one? Um, so just maybe getting a little bit into the nuance of one and two, and can you go back and forth again with those diagnoses? Sure, so let me start with the easy part, which is the adults or easier part. <laughs> And, and um, it, it, it's, it's changed over time, but it, it, there's a little bit of controversy of whether or not bipolar one is separate from bipolar two or whether or not it's along a spectrum. So there are still debates about that. But with bipolar one, people have unequivocal manic episodes, meet full criteria, have severe disruptions in their lives. With bipolar two, Two, it's with hypomanic episodes that, while still not great to have, are less disruptive of their lives 
less severe in terms of the intensity and also the duration. Now, that being said, what do you do with somebody who's completely and absolutely manic for two days? They don't meet criteria, which is four days. What is, what is that? And so there's a whole nother area of sort of the spectrum of the disorder. And if you think about it sort of logically, you know, people don't necessarily have to fall into these categories. You can have a full spectrum. It just makes it more difficult to diagnose somebody. So th those are thought to be the two, the two main ones. And the one other one that's worth mentioning, which really we know very little about, is an unequivocal manic episode that is unequivocally precipitated by an antidepressant, right? And only precipitated by an antidepressant. We don't know exactly what that is, but we assume that it's bipolar disorder. So then what's the easy part, Tina gets? <laughs> or gets what's the, the hard part, Tina gets? <laughs> she gets the kids. <laughs> Yeah, so um, so I love the question in the chat about can you we call it converting um, in childhood, but I guess the same could be language could be used in adulthood. So that someone initially presents and they have a diagnosis, for example, of bipolar two disorder. So they have had a clear hypomanic episode and a clear depressive episode. No question, they have a bipolar two diagnosis. And then I'm following them over two years and they go on to have a full manic episode, more than one week, very severe manic symptoms. So we would call that person a converter from bipolar two, which they had when we first met them. They never had a full manic episode before, but then they go on to develop bipolar one disorder. And so at that point in time, their diagnosis would be bipolar one disorder. Um, and then it's also true that that catch all category that Dr. Nirenberg was talking about, we generally call it other specified bipolar disorder. It used to be called not otherwise specified, but it really is this clearly bipolar but not quite bipolar one and two. And most people meet that other specified category because like dear Dr. Nirenberg indicated, they don't quite have their symptoms for a long enough time, like the DSM tells us they need to, or the DSM tells us they need a certain number of symptoms from a certain number of categories, and they might be one or two symptoms shy. But we use our clinical intuition and say, this person clearly has bipolar disorder. They just don't quite fit that bipolar two or bipolar one mold, mainly for one of those two reasons. So those people with bipolar otherwise specified, so I meet a patient today, you know, they've definitely had some hypomania, but it's never quite lasted long enough in order to be considered bipolar two disorder. So I might give them a diagnosis of bipolar otherwise specified, but then in the course of our work together, I see that they've had a full hypomanic episode lasting, you know, three weeks and they're getting a bunch done. They're not sleeping very much. They feel great on top of the world. At that point, we would probably revisit their diagnosis and consider them to have converted from bipolar otherwise specified to bipolar two disorder. And in fact, we have a bunch of longitudinal data on kids that conversion rates are actually quite high among young children from bipolar otherwise specified to bipolar two and from bipolar two to bipolar one if we follow them over time. Not everybody, but about 40% of the, those with bipolar otherwise specified eventually will meet criteria for bipolar two. And it's another quarter of people with bipolar two who will go on to develop bipolar one. And it's really part of that period of development. Like this, this disorder is literally unfolding before our eyes throughout childhood and adolescence. Um, and the other really important point I want to make during childhood is that um, when we look at our data on these bipolar otherwise specified, bipolar two, bipolar one. I know when I was in school, I was taught that bipolar one is the worst. Bipolar two is not as bad. Bipolar otherwise specified is the least severe. And 
the truth is getting back to that point about like what most matters to people, it turns out if you look at how people are functioning, how they're doing in their lives, it doesn't really matter. Bipolar disorder is very impairing regardless of what your type of bipolar disorder is. And there are plenty of people with bipolar one disorder who function very well and bipolar two and bipolar otherwise specified and vice versa. So it doesn't necessarily mean if you convert from bipolar two to bipolar one that your disorder has gotten worse. Um, it, it's just changed over time. And, and that makes me also think, uh, Dr. Goldstein, that contrary to what you would think, it's really the depression that is the biggest burden, at least for the adults. And, and I wonder if it's the same for kids. Unfortunately, absolutely. Um, that it turns out we're much better at treating mania and hypomania than we are at treating bipolar depression. Um, and so that is absolutely where the vast majority of the suffering, functional impairment, um, you know, and distress come in is from not only full threshold depressive periods, but the periods in between episode where the person doesn't quite return to themselves. They have some lingering depressive symptoms that we are just not that good yet between medication and psychotherapy at fully clearing up those episodes in between. And I believe the adult data are similar. Yeah, the, the adult data are similar. And certainly, you know, there, there are lots of people who can respond fully. Uh, it, it's just more of a challenge. Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing is that we have very limited medication, a limited number of medications that have been FDA approved. And many people will use combinations that not have not necessarily been improved, uh, approved, but they prescribe it anyway from sort of reasoning from what has been approved. And I'm specifically talking about the antidepressants. And certainly in the adult world, it is the most common treatment for bipolar depression, even though there really aren't any studies that show that the antidepressants at least alone don't work and can hurt some people. Although with bipolar two, there are a few studies here and there, not clear if that's true, but if you combine an antidepressant with something that's anti-manic, will that help? There's only one combination that has been approved. That's a lanzapine fluoxetine, Zyprexa Prozac combination, but people do it anyway. And, and I think the jury is not out about whether or not it can really help or not. Um, can we talk a little bit about uh, rapid cycling then? And because I feel like this is a natural segue into that. Rapid cycling mixed um, episodes. So, so the, the formal definition of rapid cycling came from David Dunner, who, who um, defined it as being four distinct episodes per year. Now, that turns out to be a problem in terms of what does that mean, right? So if you have separate episodes, well, supposedly they would have to be separated by two months apart. Otherwise, it's kind of a continuation of the same episode, or it's an episode that hasn't fully resolved, or it's an episode that's waxing and waning, you know, so, so it's a little hard to know what that means for people. But there, there are people who can really very rapidly go from one state to another, and they can do it multiple times a day, multiple times a, a week, a month, and right? So you can have a lot of variation in the course of what people have. And as Dr. Goldstein mentioned before, paradoxically, you can be manic and depressed at the same time. And that's the, the mixed that's mixed. Next episode. Um, well, I think um, maybe we can talk. We've we've talked a little bit here and there about sort of this arc um, of bipolar disorder, but maybe we can have a conversation on, you know, some we brought up some on on um, you know children with it may come out as um, ADHD and that. But can you talk if you if you would. Is there an arc? Is there a, a way 
um, to describe this, a uh, way to get people to imagine what that might look like as they enter the different developmental stages? Sure. I think um, Tina, yeah, you, or Dr. Goldstein, you would start on that one. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I think, again, it's about looking at what is developmentally normative. And so oftentimes when we're talking with families, we'll say, you know, think about your, you know, your other kids who, you know, don't have some of these challenges, you know, what, you know, what did you notice in them and how does this child compare or think about some of their peers, for example, um, you know, so if, you know, they're at the amusement park with their friends, it's totally normative to be excited, maybe talking fast, skipping around, right? Um, that, that those are things we might expect from, you know, a nine or 10 year old. And what we're looking for is this is this is a step up. This is where um, even the other kids around this child would be saying like, whoa, settle down or, you know, you're too much. Or oftentimes we hear kids say like, they think I'm taking drugs and I'm not, um, you know, that it's really that pronounced. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, those are kind of some of the hallmarks that we would look for throughout development. Um, and, you know, we're really looking for in terms of diagnosing bipolar disorder, things that are episodic. So these are clear changes from that child's baseline. And so getting to your question about ADHD and bipolar disorder, given that they're so highly comorbid. So ADHD is a chronic condition by and large. And so a child who has untreated ADHD, we would expect to generally speaking, always across multiple situations, at school, at home, with their friends, at camp, wherever it might be, have difficulty with concentration, with impulsivity, with attention, that that's gonna be coming up very, very consistently across settings. And so, whereas we might expect for a child without ADHD, they kind of have a baseline of attention and concentration. And there's there are wide ranges, even within what's normal. Some kids from a very young age can sit down and finish a puzzle in 45 minutes without running off. And some kids can do five minutes and then go flit on to the next thing. But the question is, when does it start getting in the way? For most of these kids, when we start to see them is when they enter school, when they can't stay seated in their chair, when they are you know, blurting out answers, when they can't wait in line, those kinds of things can't keep their hands to themselves. And so with a child with ADHD, we expect to see that pretty consistently over time and across settings. Whereas with a child with bipolar disorder, we're looking for clear episodes where that would worsen. And so if a child has both ADHD and bipolar disorder, their baseline's a little bit higher or maybe a lot higher mm -hmm. than their peers. And on top of that, there would be these periods of exacerbation where their symptoms would get more and worse and more severe and more impairing, right? And so what we're looking for is trying to establish what is this child's baseline. The baseline may be anxiety. The baseline may be ADHD. Those are things that tend to be more chronic, though anxiety can sometimes wax and wane. Um, but that we see those kind of to be more stable over time, whereas the bipolar disorder, we're looking for these really clear episodes where the symptoms cluster together. And so that's some of, you know, kind of the challenge in differential diagnosis in working with young people, and particularly that differential between ADHD and bipolar disorder, looking for chronic versus episodic. I love how much you're saying episodic um, for for one reason of or for a good reason of hearing people use the word bipolar just in regular um, regular every day and so oh she's so bipolar and now viewers can say well was it episodic or was it just you know are they this way all the time so we're going to have many diagnosers running around but I do think that is such an important um, uh, point. To go. Um, and, and there's an adult counterpoint to what Dr. Goldstein said, because a lot of adults who were never diagnosed with ADHD, 
who have bipolar disorder turn out to have ADHD, but mm -hmm. adults are not necessarily just bigger children. Now, the vast majority of the adults once were children, right? But, but they're not just bigger children. So, so the adult ADHD can manifest itself in really very different ways of being disorganized. You can't pay attention in meetings. You can't finish things that are kind of boring and routine and you procrastinate and you're late all the time. And again, it's a cluster of things that are fairly consistent for a very long time, but never quite recognized because people think that's just the way who they are. That's who they are. Yeah. Um, well, something we have not touched upon, we say adult, but um, uh, late onset or older adult. Um, can you talk a little bit about where that comes in? Have, so how much, you, what have you seen with it? Yeah, sorry, go ahead. So, no, it's okay. So usually what happens is something that I referred to before is that people can have a lifetime of recurrent depressions without mm -hmm. ever having a manic episode and then boom, they're 50 years old, they have their first unequivocal manic episode, and, and it becomes much clearer that they have bipolar disorder. So usually you don't see the first manifestation of either depression or mania late on. Usually there's, there's something that's happened beforehand. And in fact, if I see somebody who is older, and we can all define what older means, but if you see someone who, who's older and they have their first ever mood episode of mania or something, the presumption is it's medical. It usually doesn't just start out of the blue, although rarely it could. You can think that there's an age distribution, but this really is a developmental disorder. As Dr. Goldstein said before, more than half of people have the first manifestations of bipolar disorder when they're young. Uh, there are some uh, questions in the chat I would like to interject about aging as well that seem appropriate here. Um, there's two, I'm gonna piggyback them. Um, the first, does bipolar start to look different as one ages? So in old age versus young adulthood. And then I guess another question that goes nicely with that is can symptoms of bipolar, this person is asking specifically about bipolar two, lose intensity with age? So do they look different as, as age occurs when we diagnose someone? And, and then second, does it look different in intensity with age? So if, if I could take the first stab of that, um, uh, Kraepelin, early in the 1900s, uh, uh, did a very careful study uh, observing what people had, who he was taking care of. And the older people were, the more they would manifest with depression rather than with mania. So something happens over time where the proportion of time that someone is ill is spent more in depression than in mania as people age. And, and that while you can have older people with mania, it's just not as frequent. Yeah, and you know, talking on kind of the other end of the spectrum for our young people who are diagnosed as children and adolescents, as we followed them, you know, there are a couple of things have started to jump out in some of these longitudinal studies. So one Dr. Nirenberg also talked about is the development of substance use disorders in late adolescence and young adulthood are extraordinarily common um, in individuals with bipolar disorder. Um, you know, for some people, their um, disorder will convert over time. So they may start with a bipolar two diagnosis and then, you know, in late adolescence, adulthood, have a manic episode and have bipolar one disorder. Um, you know, some of the diagnoses that we see so commonly occurring, co-occurring with bipolar disorder in childhood are more specific to childhood. So for example, oppositional defiant disorder. It's not to say it can't happen in adults. There can be patterns in adulthood, um, but that in general, many of the youth don't then go on to continue to have oppositional defiant disorder in adulthood. Um, some of the other things that we can sometimes see kind of changing throughout um, development, a lot of separation anxiety disorder when the youth are younger, whereas in um, 
adulthood, there's much more prevalence of panic disorder that we don't tend to see in children, some in late adolescence. Um, so thinking about the way anxiety might present itself differently through the course of someone's life who has bipolar disorder. Um, I'm trying to think of other kind of developmental differences that we see. Um, one of the commonalities that we haven't yet talked about that I think is really critical um, is risk for suicidal thoughts and behaviors. Um, that certainly young people are entirely capable of having suicidal thoughts and acting on their suicidal thoughts. Um, however, the fact is that um, as children age, they tend to have more access to more lethal means. And so, um, you know, for us all to be really thoughtful about suicide risk assessment and management, um, because it is such a, a critical consideration. And the data suggests that people who have earlier onset of their illness in childhood and adolescence are actually at greater risk as they age. Um, so these are, you know, kind of several of the things we consider across um, the lifespan. Well, we have, um, uh, we're, we're, people are waiting for some treatment options. <laughs> I have a feeling at this point, they've heard a lot about symptoms and development. Can we, um, can we switch to treatment options and maybe we'll, we'll go with the, the lifespan. Um, Dr. Goldstein, if you want to talk about uh, with children. Sure. So, um, I mean, there's just no question that no matter if you're a child, adolescent, adult, or later adult, that that a combination of medication and psychotherapy in general seems to be the best approach to acute treatment of bipolar disorder and longitudinal management. Now that's not to say that everybody needs to be on medication for their entire life or that everybody needs to be in therapy for their entire life. And I wish we had more data on when are the best times to start and stop and change. But in general, we know that those are the approaches that have the most support behind them. So. If it's okay with you, Dr. Nirenberg, I'll lean more on the psychotherapy side because I'm a psychologist <laughs> um, and that tends to be more um, my bread and butter and what I know and do, though certainly medications and psychotherapy go hand in hand. And ideally, I think teams of providers um, who communicate with one another and communicate clearly with um, our patients and families is what's so critical to managing bipolar disorder and co-occurring conditions. So that being said, I think there are you know multiple evidence-based treatments now for treating bipolar disorder, both in childhood and up until adulthood. And uh, my colleagues and I who do this work all agree that they actually, you know, there's a million different CBT, DBT, IPT, everything with a T on the end, that's therapy <laughs> um, or treatment. But at the end of the day, there are actually some really core common principles of good treatment, good psychotherapy for bipolar disorder. And I'm happy to get more into the nuances of the different treatments um, and talk more about that. But at the end of the day, I think what's so critical um, is that families are getting good education about bipolar disorder, understanding, and we call that psychoeducation as part of therapy. You know, what are your symptoms? What does that mean? Um, what does it mean for your treatment? How do you track those over time? Um, helping people to recognize their own patterns so that we can, you know, if someone is euthymic right now, let's watch really closely and see what are the first warning signs and symptoms that you might be going into a depressive episode. Because the sooner we can recognize that, the more we can help potentially stave off that depressive episode and or make sure it's brief. But that really it's about empowering patients and families to understand their own illness, understand their own treatment options and be able to communicate with their teams about their own symptoms. Because at the end of the day, that is critical when living with any illness, but certainly with bipolar disorder. So that's one really critical piece. Another really critical piece of 
a good evidence-based treatment for bipolar disorder is learning skills, skills for communicating with family, um, with partners, with teachers, um, you know, communicating what you're feeling, what you're needing, how to solve problems. All families have problems and certainly bipolar disorder can be stressful. And so giving families skills for communicating with one another and with everyone around them. Um, skills like emotion regulation, so, you know, we may not be able to cure your depression today. Medications take time, therapies take time, but what skills can you find that are going to help you manage, get through knowing that it's hard? And so there's emotion regulation skills to try and kind of manage those ups and downs, distress tolerance skills for when things are really bad. How do you like get through without making it worse? Um, so these are some of the skills that we would be teaching in just about any of these evidence-based treatments. There are also some cognitive skills. So paying attention to our own thoughts and how our thoughts affect how we feel and how we act and being able to help recognize those with the help of a professional, how those impact your own mood, your own behaviors, and how you can use all of all of these skills together to live a better life, you know, suffer less. Um, so that's a little bit about the psychotherapy piece. And I know Dr. Nirenberg, you can talk much, much more about the medication piece. So the medication piece is uh, made up of treatment of acute episodes and prevention of future episodes. And for the treatment of acute episodes, there are the anti-manic drugs and there are the antidepressive drugs, but bipolar antidepressive drugs. And then there's a loose term, which is a mood stabilizer, which usually refers these days to uh, lithium, valproate, and maybe some of the other anticonvulsants like lamotrigine. Uh, what is really interesting is that the median number of medications that people take is about three. So usually one medication doesn't do it. It's rare that someone can take one, um, but none of them work well enough, but they work together so that you can effectively treat an acute episode and prevent future ones. Now, the whole field is in pretty good agreement that the gold standard medication is lithium, but about a third of people will end up doing really well with lithium over time. And paradoxically, lithium was the last medication that was specifically developed for bipolar disorder. All of the other medications since lithium, we're talking 1948, have been derived from other things, particularly the antipsychotics, which turn out to be anti-manic in general. And then there's a smaller subset that are FDA approved for bipolar depression. So that's in a nutshell, but along with what Dr. Goldstein was talking about, this really works best when there's shared decision-making with the person who is seeking help and the person who is prescribing, both in terms of monitoring how people are doing in terms of symptoms and especially in terms of side effects. Because the people who have bipolar disorder have to live with taking the medication every day and have to live with the side effects. So it's, it, it's a very important conversation to have and it's a very important negotiation to have of what you're willing to take, what is worth it and what is not worth it. And, and that should always veer towards what's optimal for the person. It gets back to the question, what matters to you? This is, um, I think, Hannah, there are, I'm seeing a lot of questions build up in the Q&A. Do you want to, um, to segue into some question answers? Yeah, absolutely. There are a lot of great um, questions in the chat. So let's see what is going to make uh, sense to ask first. So can you talk about the different type of therapies that are most beneficial to folks with bipolar? I think we already touched on that a little bit, 
Um, but I'm wondering if, um, you know, maybe you both want to name like top, top three approaches. <laughs> well, I, I, I do want to add one thing that I'm sure Dr. Goldstein will, will agree. And, and the therapy is listen to your mother, <laughs> which, which me, which means get enough sleep, eat a good diet, get exercise and don't do drugs. <laughs> Some great, yeah. great basic advice for people. We love that. Absolutely. Critical, common components of all treatments that it turns out, I mean, we can laugh about it. It turns out that actually things like sleep um, and, you know, kind of keeping a, a stable schedule, not too much stimulation, not too little stimulation is central to all of these treatments and quite central to stability um, in bipolar disorder. So no question. And that is actually a primary focus of one of the evidence-based treatments, which is called interpersonal social rhythm therapy, which is focused on um, helping people really stabilize their daily schedules when you sleep, when you eat, when you interact with other people and how much you do of each of those things and recognizing that there are so many stressful things that can occur, both good things and bad things can cause mm -hmm. stress in our lives that can throw all of that off kilter. Um, so for example, having a baby, having a wedding, um, you know, um, the start of the school year again, um, you know, going on vacation, all of these things can kind of destabilize our schedules, which we know in turn can destabilize mood, particularly in people with a vulnerability to bipolar disorder. So that's a major focus of IPSRT or interpersonal and social rhythm therapy and thinking about also how our relationships can contribute to destabilizing mood and daily rhythms. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy, which focuses on the interaction between the way we think, the way we feel, and the way that we behave or act, um, also has tons of data um, in individuals with bipolar disorder. Um, increasingly, there's more data for dialectical behavior therapy, both in terms of helping to stabilize mood, but also interestingly in helping to decrease suicide risk mm -hmm. in people with bipolar disorder. Um, so I would say those are three kind of central. Another one that's really critical to focus on is um, family focus therapy is, um, and one of the reasons I think it's so important to mention that is that, you know, it, it's so helpful to not only be working with the person who's diagnosed with bipolar disorder, but also be helping everyone around them one, to understand what it is that the person with bipolar disorder is living with, how they can help support that individual, how they can communicate more effectively. And sometimes it's other people who notice even before we do that we're starting to have symptoms. I mean, one of the symptoms of mania is not realizing that your behavior is out of the ordinary. And so helping people around you to better help you um, and to have a common language for talking about it. And the other thing that I think it goes without saying is we know that bipolar disorder is a very highly genetic illness. It's not entirely genetic, but it's highly heritable. And so it's not uncommon, particularly in our work with kids and adolescents, we bring in the whole family to teach them about bipolar disorder and teach them these same skills because many of them have parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, siblings who may have bipolar disorder, may have other mood problems as well. And the more we can help the whole system to manage their own mood difficulties, the better off everyone is. And so um, family-focused therapy is a good example of a family-based treatment to help improve communication and, um, and education about bipolar disorder. And you know, many of these treatments, we, there's evidence for both in adults and in um, adolescents, particularly. Yes. Well, that's through, oh, 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 yes, Maria. I was just going to say the through line of um, awareness, having awareness of your thoughts, of your mood, um, whether it's for yourself or or for your loved one, uh, is is so key in this. Um, so I just. Want to point out probably what is obvious to everybody else. I'm just going to say it out loud. Anna, more questions? <laughs>
Yeah, we've got great questions. Um, I really like this one. It's kind of unique. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the link between bipolar and eating disorder? Uh, this person is saying binge eating disorder is often brought up, but restrictive eating disorders um, might be ignored even in the inpatient setting. So can you talk a little bit about kind of that overlap and how people might approach treatment for that? Well, in, in adults, uh, I, I think that in the absence of bipolar disorder, both binge eating disorder and anorexia are, are quite challenging to address. Um, and, and it's mostly uh, psychotherapy that I think can help people more than any specific type of medication. And in many ways, you could see it as a dysregulation of emotional eating, and that when people are in distress, they can either veer towards food as comforting, food tends to be pretty comforting. Uh, and, and if somebody doesn't recognize their distress link to eating, then they can get into this pattern of a lot of binge eating because it gives them some solace, it decreases their anxiety, and then they feel bad about it later, but it's rewarding enough that they'll do it. Um, the, the mystery of why restrictive eating is somehow rewarding for people is still something I think we don't quite understand. And that also, I think it's more of a behavioral way to try to help people. But in general, for people who overeat in response to distress, there's a very good way to help people recognize that, be aware of that, and then make it a choice that somebody, you try to put a thought between that feeling and the impulse to eat. Yeah, I think we approach it very, very similarly in young people. Um, and, um, and recognizing that that's some of where the role of those skills in managing emotions can come in, right? There are a million ways to try and manage difficult, uncomfortable emotions. And, you know, some tend to be more in line with our goals than others. And so, you know, sometimes people won't have other skills for managing, you know, intense despair when they're depressed. And so what they've learned to do is comfort themselves through food or binge eating. And it makes perfect sense. It works. I mean, all of the brain studies show um, that in the short term, people do actually feel better. Um, the problem is in the long term, then you know, eating disorders can develop, people may feel unhealthy, it may not be in line with their goals. And so that's some of where psychotherapy can be helpful. And the same is true with, um, with restricting. And I think the other important point here is that um, eating patterns are also affected. They are a symptom of both depression and mania. And so that's some of where this, you know, all of these disorders have, you know, it's more and less overlap, but at the end of the day, it makes perfect sense how these things tend to co-occur over time, you know, sometimes with depression and certainly with some of the medications um, that we give for management of bipolar disorder, appetite can be increased. That's a symptom of the depression. And so then couple that with low mood and seeking ways to feel better. It's kind of like a perfect storm sometimes for the development of an eating disorder. And sometimes when people are manic, they may forget to eat for days at a time because they are just, you know, so revved up. Um, and, you know, sometimes people lose their appetites during depression too. And so sometimes those can start patterns of eating that are not normal for that individual, but that come out of these episodes of disordered mood. One of our most um, hit pages on, on our website is how do I lose weight on an antidepressant? And we really, uh, we really need to have a whole webinar on that question, uh, question alone. And I think it points to what you were just talking about, Dr. Goldstein, of the medication, but also um, how we uh, react in certain moods. Yeah. Um, continuing to pull from the chat, uh, uh, continuing on the theme of co-occurring conditions, um, how common is it to have bipolar one and autism 
specifically Asperger's, and I'm going to tag on to this person's question, uh, just how, how might we understand that in childhood too, diagnosing um, either, either one or both of those um, conditions in childhood? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I mean, certainly it is possible to have a co-occurring autism spectrum disorder along with bipolar disorder. I honestly don't know the statistics off the top of my head. It, I would say it's not among the most common co-occurring conditions, but certainly not unheard of. Um, we definitely see plenty um, in our clinic. Um, some of where it's tricky in childhood is that um, is that in autism spectrum disorders, and particularly in some of the, you know, kind of what used to be called Asperger's and now is level one, but, you know, if you're thinking about autism as a full spectrum, is that um, emotion regulation difficulties increasingly are recognized as part of that autism spectrum disorder. And so um, it's also challenging for that differential diagnosis. Again, we just go back to our trusty old DSM um, to try and distinguish autism spectrum disorder from bipolar disorder, um, but certainly they commonly co-occur. We, we tend to anecdotally use very similar treatments for targeting the emotion dysregulation, um, although certainly there are also other evidence-based treatments for individuals with autism spectrum disorders. And so sometimes we have a specialty clinic here for individuals on the autism spectrum. And so, you know, oftentimes we'll work together to coordinate our treatments to make sure that we're targeting whatever it is that's most impairing for that person. Um, what about in adulthood, Dr. Nirenberg? I'm curious what you all see uh you can see it it, it is uh not that frequent mm -hmm. um but but certainly you know when these people grow up they they're there mm -hmm. the other thing i will i i i've been thinking about increasingly as many of the young people are aging into adulthood and i've seen that over you know the course of my career and have even seen some patients through those periods is that you know bipolar disorder also can kind of disrupt some normative social trajectories, um, you know, so that you know some of our youth may miss out on some critical social development during junior high or high school because they're in a severe depressive episode. Um, they spend some time in the hospital or in a residential treatment facility, and so they may be missing out on some key opportunities for social development that their peers might have. And so, you know, sometimes that can also look a little bit like autism spectrum disorder because they may kind of almost like have delays in their social development because of some of the emotional difficulties they've had with their mood episode early on. Um, so I think that's not uncommon, but it requires a really careful diagnosis to determine whether that means that the person is autistic um, in addition to having bipolar disorder, or whether, you know, they have some delays that ultimately they may catch up. And honestly, I've seen both. Um, going to the chat again. Um, this was a follow-up question um, from when we were talking a little bit more about older adults. And someone is asking um, that, um, I think Dr. Nuremberg, you made the point that um, mania might decrease with age, but this person is wondering if the severity of depression um, worsens with age. And I think we started to, to touch on that, but can you speak to that a little bit? Well, it, it, it depends what you mean by severity, right? And whether the severity is the intensity and the duration of symptoms and the dysfunction associated with it, or is it response to treatment? And there's a full variety of, of uh, spectrum of, of that, so that some people can still have depressions that are treatable and, and fine, and other people can have what I think is increasingly recognized is actually treatment-resistant bipolar depression. Very difficult to treat depression that is just not responding what one would hope uh, the depression would respond to. And uh, that is an area that really is relatively understudied. Great, thank you. Um, looking again to the chat, we only have five more minutes, so I wanna make sure I get in as many questions as possible. Um, 
What are your thoughts on the misdiagnosis of bipolar or oppositional defiant disorder in children with trauma? Whoa. <laughs> That's a big one. That's a big one. <laughs> it is a really big one. And it's very, very challenging. Um, you know, and again, not at all, unfortunately, uncommon that we're seeing young people present with, you know, definite mood problems, um, definite behavioral problems like oppositional defiant disorder and exposure to a lot of adversity and or trauma. Um, and so, you know, this is where I feel really fortunate that I work in a clinic where we're able to do assessments over multiple visits and extended assessments, because I know in the community, my colleagues get 50 minutes with the family in order to do a diagnostic assessment. And I will be honest with you, I would be hard pressed to walk away from a 50 minutes with a kid presenting with this presentation with any definitive answer. Um, and so I have lots of compassion for my colleagues in the community and families um, who come out with you know, multiple different diagnoses and everyone's doing the best they can, but it really requires a very in-depth, um, you know, oftentimes, you know, multi-informant diagnosis, oftentimes longitudinally. Um, that includes, you know, looking carefully at prior treatments and responses, um, understanding the course over time of the trauma exposure and um, and the the child's mood symptoms and behavioral symptoms. So um, it's it, I don't think there are any magic right answers to it. It really goes back to, you know, kind of grounding ourselves in the DSM diagnoses, looking for clear episodes. Again, ODD, we expect to be more of a chronic condition. Um, and we also want to be thinking about the temporality of when did these symptoms emerge in relation to a major trauma. Mm -hmm. Great. Again, staying on the themes of young adults and uh, young people, um, how can we tell if a medication is working? This is being asked by a parent who's in the audience. Um, you know, sometimes this, this person's commenting, sometimes their level of functioning is not great and sometimes it's okay. Um, so yeah, how, how can parents really be observing their children to understand if a medication is working? That's a great question. I will tell you from the therapist point of view, and then Dr. Nirenberg, you can say from a psychiatrist point of view. Um, generally, when I'm working with families and their um, medication changes, so everyone would be, you know, kind of using a mood diary, energy diary, you know, something that they're tracking the target symptoms um, over time. And so the most important question that I always encourage families to ask is, what is this medication supposed to be treating? Um, because understandably, it's confusing, right? There are multi, all of these kids and families, that, you know, the average is three medicines. Um, and, you know, this one's meant to treat the ADHD symptoms. This one's meant to treat the depression. This one's the mood stabilizer. But what exactly does that mean? And so when there's a change, first asking, what is this change meant to target specifically? Okay, and so that's the first thing, being clear about what is it that I am looking for, both in terms of things getting better, but also in terms of things getting worse, um, because sometimes these medicines don't work the way we hope they will, or somebody may have an adverse um, reaction. And so first being clear about that, but then very carefully having the parent, the child, if the child's old enough, um, you know, really carefully hone in on what it is that we're hoping to see change and use some rating scale. It can be gross one to 10. You know, if this is meant to help with your depression, you know, let's watch very carefully over time how your depression is or is not changing or your impulsivity is or is not changing or your irritability is or is not changing. And it doesn't mean you have to track everything, but pick some things that you would be hoping to see. Um, and then the other important question to be asking yourself, your provider is, over what time period do I expect this medication to work? Some of the medications we use, like 
stimulants, for example, if it's going to work to treat ADHD, we're going to see it pretty quickly, right? Um, whereas things like antidepressants can take much, much longer to see a treatment response. And so having realistic expectations and know what am I looking for and over what period of time, and then making sure you have clear and open communication with your provider um, about that trajectory. So those are kind of my gross thoughts. Andy, do you have other? I, think, I, mean, I, I completely agree with Dr. Goldstein, and I think you can sum it up as a measurement-based care. <laughs> and that's how we'll sum up the session, measurement-based care. <laughs> we are out of time. We are one minute over, and everybody uh, looking at the participant list, everybody hung on. Thank you for hanging on. That's just how important this information is. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Nuremberg and Dr. Goldstein. This was an incredible session, and I'm so excited that it's recorded, and we can have this on our website uh, after it is done. So, And thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us today. We hope you enjoy the rest of the summit. Take Thanks care. Thanks so much. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Bye. Bye.